everyone, and welcome to Money and You, an initiative of the Financial Services Council that aims to boost your financial confidence and well-being. The topic of this episode is cybersecurity, and we've got some fantastic guests here to help us better protect ourselves and our money online. So we've got uh, she's been described as an all-round award-winning superhero, Bronwyn Groot. Uh, cybersecurity researcher Chris Hales um, and Andrew Lee from Search NZ. Welcome, guys, and thanks so much for joining the discussion today. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome. Um, now, I might just hand over to you to briefly introduce yourselves and just explain a little bit about um, what you do. So, um, I'll start with you, Bronwyn, the superhero <laughs> of the group. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've lost my cape. I better go pick it up. Um, <laughs> thanks, Clarissa. I um, am the director of Bromwyn Group Consulting Limited, and I work particularly closely with victims and families of frauds and scams. I'm really passionate about helping vulnerable New Zealanders and trying to stop the bleed. Um, but once they're caught out in a fraud and scam, um, it's emotionally and financially draining. And I'm here to help and hold their hand and not judge. That's what I do. That sounds great. And Chris, how about you? Um, well, I have a day job uh, running information security for a financial services organisation. Um, but um, in my spare time, I like to dig into the, the reasons why people fall victim to cybercrime. I did a few years with NetSafe and the National Cybersecurity Center, and then um, have done some research into people profiling and trying to sort of prevent harm. Fantastic. All right, and Andrew. Hi, I'm a senior advisor uh, with the partnership and engagement team at Certain. Uh, for those who haven't heard of us, um, Certain New Zealand is a government agency, uh, stood up probably about just over four years ago now to help raise the awareness of cybersecurity as well as respond to um, incidents um, where people can report to us. And that's basically open up to any New Zealanders, um, small businesses, government agencies, and organi big organisations. So, yeah, that's where we're there. Fantastic. All right. Um, let's kick things off. So our research has shown that a lot of Kiwis are quite concerned about their privacy and security of personal information when they're using digital technology. Um, so about 80% of the people that we surveyed earlier this year um, said that that was a big concern for them. Um, and we've also seen, you know, a lot of banks and financial service providers um, fall victim to scams um, in recent times. I'm just wondering, is, is this concern about, um, you know, scams and fraud, is it warranted? How safe is our money actually online? I'm a bit scared to ask this, but... It's always difficult. And I think the biggest problem is at the moment, particularly with COVID and the banks and branches being closed down, people are getting forced onto online devices or internet banking and things like that that they're actually not used to. And I think that's probably the biggest concern. And yes, we should be concerned. We should all go um, go into the stuff with our eyes wide open. Working at a bank, I can I can authoritatively say that um, from the bank's perspective, it's very safe. Um, yeah, it very much comes down to the uh, the customer, I suppose, in terms of the, the steps that they've taken to protect themselves. So I know um, we, in the cybersecurity community, we spend a lot of time messaging about things and we try and persuade people, you know, that there are simple steps to take. Often there's, there is complexity in that messaging and there's things that people don't necessarily understand. Certainly in older generation that might be being moved towards digital channels, you know, self-service apps and that kind of thing. And so some of that often gets lost in translation. Um, it's an expectation that everyone is an expert with a computer and a smartphone. Um, and so to some extent, I think there's an education gap, a digital literacy gap around what we need to do, what we can do. It's, a, it's ability and knowledge, and, and that's the real uh, area to focus on, I think, we need to take. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of that responsibility, where does that lie? Do you think that it's up to, you know, Kiwis? Is it up to us to kind of, you know, 
educate ourselves and and try to improve our own cybersecurity? Um, or you know, is there also a responsibility of um, you know financial service providers and, and banks to to help us with that? Yeah, I, d- I definitely think there is a responsibility on the part of the providers. I think you'll you'll have seen this year, particularly with um, some of the bigger banks, they've really resourced up in terms of their education efforts. Um, I can think of, of Westpac with their uh, stash the cash game, ASB and ANZ have definitely been putting money into um, communicating to customers. You know we'd like you to, to move to these digital channels and here are ways that you can protect yourself. There's some, been some really good efforts um, around this. There is, though, that shared responsibility. There's definitely a need for customers to engage. You know, it's, those surveys are always quite interesting because everyone comes out and says, we're really concerned. You know, we, we're worried about our security and our privacy. And then often there's a gap between that level of concern and then taking action. There's a sort of a privacy paradox where people carry on doing the same thing. I think we're in a position where uh, we're sort of back in the 1960s, 1970s around drink driving when it was socially acceptable to you know, have a few pints and then head home in the car. Uh, you know, there were no airbags, no seat belts. And so what we're seeing now is this kind of social model where people are being educated to, to take care of themselves and we're having to provide those controls. You know, we're teaching them how to use the seat belt and how to buy a better car with better safety measures. Okay, we'll get to some of those um, things that we can we can all do um, shortly. Um, Andrew, I might just um, turn to you with this question. Um, obviously, we you know we all like to think that we wouldn't fall victim to a scam, um, but obviously people do. And I'm just wondering what you've seen at CertNZ. You know, how many Kiwis are actually affected by cyber scams and, and fraud and is is the other number of us that are falling victim um, increasing? Are we doing better? Yeah, curious to know what you guys have seen. It's really hard to say um, whether New Zealanders, whether it be the general people, individuals, businesses, government agencies, likewise, whether they're better at spotting the scams. Uh, we like to think so. I mean, it's it's getting better. Um, well, people are getting more responsive and being aware of that. Um, and but the other, on the flip side of it, so are the scammers. They're getting much more authentic. They're getting much more sophisticated. Um, and we've seen it played out in in a, in a way that's very believable. Um, and it's all from the same group playing it out. The incidents. Um, certainly, the incidents reported to CERT has made up at least consistently about a third of incidents reported. So that's the scams and fraud category. But um, if we look a bit deeper, um, there's another form of scam called phishing. Um, and that's that's a way where um, individuals are contacted through an email. Uh, and the email looks quite authentic from somewhere authoritative, whether it be a government agency from your banks. And they've been encouraged to click on a link to verify some details. So that's another form of a scam. Um, and that's probably a little bit more uh, sinister in some ways. Uh, the scam seems to be quite, traditionally the scams have been just quite um, definitive in terms of the end result. It's always a payment aspect, but now they're actually getting much more sophisticated where they're actually asked to do something. Uh, and that's where it becomes a bit more sort of deep it certainly breaks into individuals' privacy. We talked about it before. Um, but um, being served with just one agency among many, unfortunately, agencies that help uh, manage the incidents, we work closely with other departments like police and Department of Internal Affairs, and also with NetSafe. Um, so NetSafe's an organisation which we, um, we direct individuals where they need some advice on how to manage scams Um, and recent conversation with NetSafe, they've reported uh, since lockdown, the first lockdown, um, their website relating to scam advice have been regularly visited. So clearly people are interested to find out more. So that's a good thing uh, that they're getting the visits there. So yeah. Andrew, you you talked about phishing um, and I'm quite keen to to find out a bit more about that and also some of the other types of scams that people should be looking out for. Um, I'm wondering if you if you might be able to give an example of what 
competition could look like. So, you know, what should I be looking for if if I see something in my email inbox? Um, you know, is, are there sort of um, things that I can look for that will tell me, yeah, this is definitely a scam? Phishing, it's, it's another form of scam, as I mentioned before. It's something that comes to your mailbox generally. Um, so it's, it's an email comes through. It, it will look quite legitimate. The most recent one, um, what we've seen and we're working with the agency is from Waka Kutahi, New Zealand Transport Agency, uh, where they get an email suggesting or mentioning that their uh, vehicle is up for renewal. And it's actually wow. true. They've somehow, the perpetrators have somehow um, connected to the registration system, the car registration system, and actually sending out emails to say, yep, your vehicle with the right registration number and the right date of expiry is up for renewal. And in there, somewhere along the lines, is a link to ask you for payment. Um, now, people looking at the email with the right logo and so forth would assume that's right. So they would then go and click on the link and proceed to enter their details, credit card details. Now, it all seemed quite legitimate until later on the real agency comes along and say, look, your payment has now expired. <laughs> you haven't paid. And that's when it seems a bit dubious when you then go back and say, look, I paid this and why is it coming through? So it's quite hard to actually identify. The elements where we're trying to encourage users is to look at where the email has come from. Mm -hmm. Usually a telltale sign is the, uh, the sender. The email of the sender, even though it looks like it's got the wording of the agency, but if you look closely at the email address, it's not from a, a .gov.nz government agency email address. Mm -hmm. So little things like that, it's quite hard to pick up. Uh, so it relies on the individual to actually look at the email closely, uh, which in this current digital age, it's quite hard to encourage people to do so. It's a cultural change. It's a bit like what um, Chris mentioned before. Um, it's, it's a behavioural change, and that takes a lot of effort, especially in this current age where we get a lot of emails, whether it be work, yeah. particularly social-related stuff, outside work, um, and people just go through in the process. It's like a, a muscle memory where they just click on things without actually reading things, if you know what I mean. And that's, I think that's where the scam is. And that's where phishing is doing really well. Mm -hmm. uh, but as in really well, people fall, fall into that trap. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's generally the easiest, well, simplest way of phishing. It gets worse um, sometimes when you click on the link. It actually installs something. Uh, a small script or, or otherwise on your device. Mm -hmm. um, some devices actually warn you before it's installed. Others just pops up and because of this whole me muscle fatigue, uh, muscle um, memory thing, as I mentioned, with the clicking, mm -hmm. that you click on it and it gets installed. Um, unbeknown to you, that you're doing something and harvesting your, your information and then pumping it back to the to the, um, the perpetrator. Um, so yeah, it's it's a bit hard to pick up, unfortunately. Yeah. Chris and Bronwyn, just sort of expanding on that, are there, are there other types of scams that you've noticed um, quite recently in addition to, to phishing that, um, you know, are affecting a lot of Kiwis? Are there any common ones that we should be looking out for? I think the, the big one that has hit New Zealanders recently is the smishing scam or the tech scam that's come through for the parcel deliveries because most people are expecting some sort of parcel online right and I think DIA reported something like 4,000 reports in, in, in a day or something like that from New Zealanders so and, and I've spoken to a lot of people who've actually fallen for that because they're like oh yeah I was expecting a parcel so I just clicked on it and I think as uh, Andrew mentioned there's a malware behind that one called Flubot. Uh, Chris you you can probably talk better to that than I can. Yeah, that, thanks for a minute. That's, the Flubot thing's been interesting because obviously um, that campaign's been really quite successful. I think the numbers that I've heard of late have, have been really substantial in terms of the number of people that have um, fallen for it and then maybe, you know, infected their Android phone. Um, like Bronwyn says, it's it's coincidental around timing. So um, your, your, those performance shaping factors about 
I'm expecting a parcel, a coincidental arrival of a text and click, click, click. Like Andrew said, you know, it's we're habituated into doing these things and uh, the bad guys uh, have, a, have a good outcome. I think, uh, you know, not long ago, there was another campaign around COVID testing as well. Obviously, lots of us are in a heightened state of concern. You know, we're worried about health and we're worried about levels up and down. And then there was a campaign that was sent out saying, you know, for your test result or to take your test or to go for your vaccination. I know CERT has been charged with sort of um, securing the whole kind of COVID environment as well around those that misinformation. So the bad guys are just looking for an opportunity to, to strike, really, and, and they'll, they'll take it with whatever they, they've got to hand. Just on that note as well, I've had recently had a few people who've fallen for the inland revenue phishing scam. So they assume you know they thought yes I've got taxes due they've clicked on a phishing email it's asked them what who they bank with they've given a, a selection of banks to choose from they've then clicked on who they bank through to and it's then taken them to a fake bank website which they then logged in um, had their information and then their bank accounts have also been uh, compromised and and funds accessed which from the victim's point of view, the responsibility then comes back on them. The banks are not going to reimburse you because you were the one that actually clicked on the link. So it's a really painful um, process to actually go through, through, you know, not only emotionally but financially as well. What's the worst thing that can happen if you do click on a link? Um, is it just a case of you might lose a bit of money or you know you get some software installed on your phone or your computer what's the actual impact that this can have on a person so the immediate impact would probably be a bit of inconvenience okay um so what happens is with these that are installed worst case is your your phone then Get, you know, the message then replicates itself on your phone and it gets sent to all your contacts on your phone. And so that's a bit of inconvenience here. But that very quickly then leads on to potentially, if it's installed, something installed on your, your phone, it potentially might be harvesting information um, inside your phone. Things like your passwords to various accounts, potentially access to your bank account if you've got a banking app installed on it. Um, in terms of money lost, it, there's potentially as a side side, you know, that could be a, a, one of the issues there. But perpetrators are now becoming more. Money is one thing, uh, and that's only a, a definite outcome. But what they're looking for is something that continues to give. So uh, information is key. So we talk about credential harvesting. That's a term that we use in the cybersecurity industry and others as well. But that's where individual details, personal details, uh, and potentially um, information to your work details, because ultimately when we're working from home now and people are a bit more open about bringing your own personal device into a work environment, information that you use to log in from your home PC to a work environment in a secure environment, potentially to be harvested, all those details. So it's, you know, it's, it's the information that's gold and that's something that could be, you know, that could um, provide a, a good, um, certainly, you know, um, it's, it's something that could be sold for a good amount of money on, on dark web. And that's just from one individual. If you can imagine the multitudes of individuals all published on the web, that itself presents a huge risk um, to the individual and to organisations where the individual works. I think I can talk to um, a few cases, certainly that, you know, that Bronwyn is very, you know, familiar with these as well, is that, that account takeover piece. Um, one of the most significant things I think I experienced at NetSafe was when someone's uh, email account was taken over. And as Andrew says, you know, the, the attacker maintains persistence. In effect, you have a bad guy who's got your credentials or tricked you into logging in or somehow got access to your email account and then they just sit there and they read your emails and then they, they have this ability to kind of rifle through your your digital filing cabinet and go after information I can remember one case oh, probably six or seven years ago of a nurse who had a gmail account that didn't have multi-factor authentication on it didn't have this second layer of protection 
and somebody sat in her Gmail account and reading all of her emails and, and found copies of her passport and her nursing qualification and then managed to use those identity documents to actually secure a job in Australia and pretend to be her. So there's identity fraud and theft. Um, damaged her credit record. Uh, in some cases, when you've got access to a company email account as well, you're sitting there, you can set up filters and forwards and then you can take invoices and then send those through to other people and, um, and sort of defraud those third parties and actually you know, do invoice fraud, what's called business email compromise. And that's really quite significant. That's into hundreds of thousands of dollars that can get stolen or misdirected. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I know um, we, we're just the bearers of doom and gloom, but it's, <laughs> but hopefully raising awareness. And I think, um, as Andrew mentioned, and, and Chris, you know, one, uh, so many people have said to me when I'm out presenting, what do people, what are the scammers or the offenders, what do they want with my information? I'm just one little person, you know, doing my own thing. Um, maybe I'm an older New Zealander. They're not going to want my information. Now, one, just one little part of your information they not, may not want, but once they have access to that big picture, as Andrew said, it's absolute gold on the black market and, um, and they'll use it over and over again. Um, and Bronwyn, I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about some of the other impacts that this might have on a person. Um, I imagine, you know, if, if you are a victim of one of these scams, there might be a bit of you know, shame or embarrassment about the fact that it happened to you, potential mental health impacts as well. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering how, how it could impact someone beyond just losing money or, um, you know, identity theft. Not that those are, are small things, but um, I imagine it has, it can have more of a long-term impact as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, 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 is, it isn't, it doesn't stop the moment you tell someone that they've been scammed or defrauded. It goes on. And depending on what the incident might be like for recently, um, I spoke to a, a lady who lost all her photos on Facebook. They were her son's photos. And for her, it was absolutely devastating. And then you've got the other extreme we talked about before, an inland revenue fish and they took over their bank account and actually siphoned off all of the funds, including her children's funds that they were saving for university because they were all linked to her, that one access number on her internet banking. Now, she has to deal with the fact that she she's a really smart woman, but she clicked on this link. Then she has to deal with the fact that the police aren't going to do anything. The banks are saying it's your fault, and she has lost all of this money that they've been saving for for so long. And sadly, I hear it a lot um, of the victims saying, Bronnie, I just don't want to wake up in the morning because they have to relive it over and over. And even when they have to go and report it, they have to go to so many different places. So you go to the banks, you tell your story, you may talk to someone who's not that sympathetic you then go to the police again. You may get someone who's not that sympathetic. You have to tell your story again. Then you have to report it to the agency. It may be CERT, it may be DIA, it may be the Financial Markets Authority. You have to tell your story over and over again. And during that process, you are going to have someone, hopefully it's not a friend or a close family member, who's going to say, geez, how can you be so blimmin' stupid? And you're already beating yourself up. So it's absolutely devastating. And with, in particular, with romance scams, and this is, there is no solid research. This is just me <laughs> having worked this stuff for around 11 years now. If, if you fall victim for a romance scam and you lose your money, what I'm seeing is it is taking, on average, the victim at least two years to recover. Oh, sorry to recover mentally um, from that. It's a long time, two years, and that's just an average, that they're beating themselves up every single day. Yeah, I can, I can imagine with the romance scams as well, you sort of formed a relationship with someone you believe is a real person, right? And, and there's that all those emotions attached to yeah. that. I can imagine that would be incredibly 
difficult to not only find out you've been scanned, but you've sort of lost a connection with a person. Um, yeah, that person that you've been talking to for maybe a few years is actually not even real. And yeah, the romance scams are, for me, absolutely the worst. And But we're seeing a lot more of it during lockdown as well. People are going online looking for love and, you know, looking for companionship. And it may just start as simple as using an app like Words for Friend, which is an online Scrabble type app. And the scammers are accessing those platforms. And also, too, when you sign up, you get jump on a dating website, you straight away you're on the back foot because a lot of the websites you may sign up for are maybe it's a Christian widow's dating website. So already the scammers know your vulnerabilities right right from the start. So and they play on those as well. So absolutely devastating. And actually on that, so I was gonna ask, you know, are there certain um, groups of people that you know, tend to be targeted by these scammers. And I guess you sort of partly answered that already, but it seems like they these scammers are looking for people that are vulnerable or in a certain position that they can then take advantage of them. Um, I'm just wondering if you go into that a bit more, like who, are there, are there people that are more likely to be a target than other people? I think we are all vulnerable. Absolutely all of us are vulnerable for any type of scam. It just depends on our mood and the actions on the day. And I think I've heard it time and time again is a victim will say to me, I, I, normally I would never ever click on that or answer that phone call or respond to the phone call, but that day I had a head cold, as simple as that. Or maybe they've had a loss of a family member or a pet or their medications have changed. Any number of things will make us vulnerable and fall for the scam. Um, myself, for instance, um, a few years ago, my daughter wanted to buy some T-shirts online. And I was busy and I was stressed and, you know, just in the, trying to get dinner on and stuff like that. She's like, mom, 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 I need, need these, this T-shirt. So I entered my credit card details and the transaction didn't go through. Now, I should have stopped at that point. But because I was being hounded by a teenager, um, I entered another credit card detail in, a, a, in a different credit card, and it went through. Next thing, I'm getting a call from the bank saying, hey, there's nine transactions of $460 coming, trying to come out of your credit card. It was that quick. It was just a dodgy website that my daughter was wanting this T-shirt off, and that's how quick and how fast it was. So essentially what you're saying is that even someone like yourself who works with the <laughs> staff it. day after day, you can also fall victim to it, right? Yep. And that's So it really is everyone, all of us, no matter how, how smart we are, um, these scammers can get us somehow. That's scary. <laughs> that's scary to me. <laughs> um, but I'd like to kind of... Okay, so we've looked at, you know, what the impact is and, and some of these common scams um, that are out there. Now I'd like to turn to, I guess, more of the positives. So, um, you know, in terms of what can we actually do about this and, and what can we do to protect ourselves? Um, I guess, um, and Andrew might go to you because, um, you know, for Cyber Smart Week, Cert NZ is, is running this campaign all about it's about cybering up and and trying to build your cyber resilience and defenses um, and protect yourself i'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about cyber smart week and yeah what you're trying to um achieve through that campaign so with um cyber smart week it aligns with the um, international cyber awareness month october is essentially the month of cyber awareness uh, for us in New Zealand, we decided to focus on a particular week or just one week of um, pushing out the awareness messages, just so that it's easier to maintain and also to manage for us as well. Um, so we've picked four different, uh, four interrelated messages. Um, so encouraging people, if they did all, any of the four, if all four of them will be better, 
um, then they're much more protected from any incidents that, that, that occur. So the four are essentially um, making your password harder to, do, to, to, um, to crack or to guess, um, checking that your privacy settings on your app, on your phone, on your devices um, are managed properly, including information that you share with people you know or not know. So that's something what we call uphold your privacy. The other thing we also encourage is to keep an eye on um, in the current stage of, you know, um, age of digital devices and so forth, there's always updates and, and information to, to, to up, upgrade on your devices. Don't ignore those. Make sure you actually update and upgrade your devices every time this message comes through. It's just that because things keep improving and obviously scammers are getting better as well so it's a bit of a, a catch-up process so every time your device is, or you get notified your device to update that don't ignore it and just update it and just even if you can't do it at the time remember to set yourself maybe a once a week to go through and do that and last but not least is what we call um, upgrade to two-factor authentication now that's a, a term that not many people understand um, but believe it or not that's something that's been around since banking has been around. Um, remember the days where you've got a card, you know, um, and you rock on up to the, the ATM on the wall. Uh, and then once you put the card in, you put in a four digit pin. So that essentially, it's a, it's a form, early form of two-factor authentication where it's something that you have, which in this case is, is your card. And you can't just put your card in and expect money to come out. You actually have to put something in that you know. So something that you have and something that you know, in this case, what you know is your PIN. And once you put the two together and they marry up and the bank verifies that's you because of what you put in, you then get what you could do on, on the ATM machine. So two-factor authentication is something that is a technical term. Um, and you also get the extension of that where it's called multi-factor authentication we enter more than two ways of identifying yourself so there are some apps where you actually have to identify yourself before you you can do anything um, fortunately from what i've seen and what i've heard um, the online banking are good at that they've actually um, developed an app which allows or the apps that they put out actually allows uh, follow that process. So that's a good thing to do, but there's other things that they probably need to be aware of as well uh, across the other apps like social media or Gmail. So those are the four different messages. Um, I firmly believe that um, putting aside the four messages there, the best thing people need to be aware of is to slow down and actually look at what you've got in front of you. I strongly believe no matter what you do, just slow down and have a read of the text, have a read of your email that's been sent through to you. Um, and as Bronwyn highlighted, it happens to everyone. It's not just her. Um, you know, it's, it's a common thing where in the busyness of things, especially in lockdown, especially with things, distraction from family, um, people get distracted very quickly. Uh, and this current age of information overload, um, that's where perpetrators prey on. It's a human it's, it's being human, essentially. So one of the things I do encourage people um, is to slow down and read your, read what's in front of you. Don't react to it so quickly. Um, and as you know, the, the, as the adage goes, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, so that's, that's generally the message I, I would encourage people to look at. And then you've got all the other four simple steps that we're doing with CyberSmart Week. Thanks for that, Andrew. Really, really good tips there. And I think that slow down message is so important. I know, yeah, everyone and, you know, myself have a habit of just, you know, you skim through things and you don't have time to look at things properly, but just taking the extra time could really pay off. Um, Chris, I'm wondering if you have any, any tips to add to that um, in terms of what people can do to protect themselves. I definitely second um, that point that Andrew shared about updating. I think one of the biggest things we see at the moment is the, the volume of, of software updates that are coming through. There's a lot of vulnerabilities in our technology. Um, the FluBot thing is quite interesting. You know, If you had a more modern Android phone, you, you're probably safe and secure. Um, for the bank that I work at, we looked at our customer base and we can identify those customers on the older devices and then take steps to kind of you know, notify them. 
Um, so definitely playing that part and, and patching things, you know, um, not ignoring updates and, and or, you know, putting those onto auto update is really, really good. Um, on the personality side, I think um, I did a piece of research with Internet NZ a few years ago around the types of people that might be more vulnerable. I think Bronwyn's right, you know, it's performance shaping factors about busyness um, and, you know, emotional kind of stuff that's going on at the moment with lockdown. But the research that I did found that certain types of people are also more likely to fall victim. So if you were unemployed for obvious reasons, you're, you know, a financial sort of danger point. And so those you know, people that were looking for jobs were actually preyed on. So understand your environment and understand your vulnerabilities. Um, I found that people that smoked were two and a half times more likely to fall victim to cybercrime. I think if you're a high risk individual by smoking, and I was a smoker for 15 years, you need to acknowledge, you know, is there something about me as an individual that might put me at a more likelihood of falling victim? So definitely that slow down piece. Think through your decisions. There's a, an American chap, um, George, uh, security um, guy, who uses the phrase slow down and frown which I think is a really lovely term. You know, he's, he's actually come up with a piece of research that says, if I read my emails whilst frowning, I'm more <laughs> likely to be cynical. And there's a whole piece of, uh, you know, sort of psychological research that says, if, you, if, you're, if you're frowning, your physical face is actually saying to your, to your mind, oh, this could be dangerous. And I think that's, it's just that, that thinking things through, you know, engaging a sort of slower mindset and, and really assessing those risks a really interesting one I'm going to try that <laughs> um Bronwyn any anything to add in terms of um your own tips for how how people can just avoid falling victim oh, I think that's absolutely right it's all around uh the amygdala hijacking that goes on in your brain it's like when you see something uh, whether it be a handbag or a new top and you think, oh my gosh, I need that so badly and I need it now and I'm going to enter my credit card details. But actually the next day, you know, the that rush has gone and, and you don't actually need it then. So it's just giving yourself time to stop and think and think it through. Like the scammers are going to to use that sense of urgency. You have to act now. You have to click on this link. You have to send the details or do what they're instructing you to do. So it's giving yourself time. Stop and think and breathe and frown. That's I think it's a great that's a great point. I'm not sure, so sure about the wrinkles that'll cause that, Chris. <laughs> um, and say you know you you do what you can to be proactive you know you you upgrade and you update things and you you're vigilant you slow down you frown you you know you're doing all the right things but somehow you know something happens that slips through the cracks you accidentally click on something um or you know you, you fall victim to a scam um and you know you realize that that's what's happened what can you do at that point where should you go who do you tell um, could you talk me through that process? The first thing you should do, the very, very first thing, if you've fallen victim to some form of scam, clicked on a link, contact your bank. That protects your finances because the scammers, yes, they want your information, but first up, they're going to want your money. So contact your bank, let them know what's happened. Tell them exactly what you've done. Don't feel stupid. Don't feel dumb tell them and then they can put some processes in place and, and secure your finances. That is where I would go first. For me, the, the, what I always say to people is, you know, think through what, what you have of value and what, what that is, you know. So Bronwyn talked about photos, somebody losing photos before. That, that's a different form of loss, but there are prevention steps that you can take. So to take backups of those. The big piece is the money, though, obviously. And um, at the moment, there's, there's you know, that shared responsibility for you as an individual to protect it. So if, if you think that you've given out a card number, if you think that you've given out you know, access to something, if someone's you've granted remote access onto your computer and they're logged in, then um, you, know, you, you really need to start thinking about just talk to the fraud team at the bank. I have a, an app for my bank where I can turn off my cards. You know, I can, I can actually control that myself. So if I'm worried about a payment, I can disable things and stuff like that. So definitely on the financial side, definitely talk to your bank. And then obviously, you know, there are other agencies that you can put, report to as well. Following on from what Bronwyn and Chris mentioned, that's exactly what we, 
we encourage people to do. Um, in fact, when we get uh, when the individual does eventually find who said us and report to us, uh, first thing we would ask is, um, have you contact your bank? Um, because it leads on to things that potentially could um, have access to their banking account, uh, especially if they have apps that's installed on their on their devices, banking apps. Um, people, yeah, strangely enough, they don't actually or haven't actually contacted the bank. They what we found is um, anecdotally is just talking to individuals, and there seems to be a, a few of them consistent trend. If they would initially talk, well. Because of the nature of the incident and also the shame factor, um, they would only talk to, to their friends, close friends. They don't even talk to their family because of oh, not um, because they feel a bit embarrassed. And it seem to be certain cultures are more susceptible to that than others. But we consistently see that they talk to their close friend about it um, and to find out what it is that they can do. Um, now, for those that don't have that luxury and just struggle with finding someone to talk to, they then sit on it for quite some time. Um, so that's something that we, we, we're trying to get the message out there. There's no shame in being, being compromised. It's just unfortunate. It's just the way things have worked out. Um, and we encourage people to let us know or the bank know as soon as possible. Um, the bank's not going to wave us. Well, we don't think the bank will wave a stick at them saying, look, you've done this. You're on your own there, buddy. Um, I think and they actually would respond in their best interest for the bank and for the individual. Uh, so it's time and time again, we find that people don't report things that quickly and we need to get the message out there. There's no shame in that. Um, but certainly the bank will be the first thing. Um, and then eventually, well, that's the, that's the tricky part, going back to a comment that was made earlier. Um, there's no central reporting site or number that people can call in New Zealand. Um, I know other countries, they have that, but certainly in New Zealand, there seems to be a, um, yeah, in some ways it's unfortunate. We haven't quite got a centralised way of um, reporting. So what we generally do is we work in with other agencies to have a no wrong rule policy and, and the same with them. So if they get something reported to, to them, and it's not within their jurisdiction, they would then share that information uh, with the person's consent with another agency to try and work through that. Because it's quite a, a traumatic time, as, you, as you've heard before from others. Um, it's not something that you want them to revisit and relive the whole experience again to another agency, um, but it is a, a, a difficult one to try to manage. But yes, yeah, certainly the first thing they would do is we suggest is to contact the bank, talk to their family members and people that are close to them there's no shame in that. And they might be able to better advise them how to better manage that. And I'm guessing too that by talking about it and sharing what's happened, you know, you're not just getting onto it for yourself, but you're also potentially helping other people, right? Because then, you know, other people that you talk to can, can go, oh, okay, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for that email um, and I won't click on that link. And by sharing the information, I imagine, you know, you're helping everyone, really. Definitely, yeah, most definitely. And, you know, it's it's just making people aware of what's going on there. Um, and it actually might just uncover um, what others are experiencing too. Um, someone else could be going through the whole thing and perhaps feel a bit embarrassed and silly about telling it to others. Um, so it's just something, and it actually does improve, and it goes... In line aligns with the message of mental wealth, uh, mental health awareness recently we had, is to talk to people, share their, the concerns you have for someone close, uh, and it could be anything, including cyber incidents. Um, yeah. Yeah, really good message. All right, we might wrap things up there. Um, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for sharing um, your knowledge and, and your tips, and hopefully... Yeah, we can help everyone to be a bit more cyber smart um, and just take some small steps to, yeah, better protect themselves. Thanks for joining me.